revealing his purpose in our lives, assuring us that we are his children, imparting his overflowing love to us until it seems our very beings will burst with his power. This is prayer. This is communion with God. You do not get this kind of communion until you have been on the cross personally. God does not pour out his spirit on uncrucified flesh. When you have had the fiery dinner with bitter herbs and your belly has become bitter with the death of the flesh, then his word becomes sweet as honey in your mouth. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, but stand thou still a while, that I may shew thee the word of God. 1 Samuel 9.27 How blessed is fellowship with other Christians! How wonderful it is to exhort and share with one another testimonies and revelations! How profitable the rebuke of a brother in Christ, and how sweet the comforting words during tribulation of one who has suffered like trials! And by praying together in the unity of the Spirit, we have the concerted power of the church before God's throne. But there are times when God wants us alone, not even our dearest and most precious friend, not even the most spiritual person we know, can intrude upon this communion. God has something to tell me that is personal just between him and me. Oh, how unspeakable and awesome are those hours in the prayer closet alone with God. This is the time that your personal victories are won. This is the place your personal callings are made known to you. These are the moments in which God whispers to you his commission for service and bestows his gifts of the Spirit to enable and empower you to perform the duties of your calling. I have had numerous friends in the ministry who upon certain occasions would counsel with me about finding the will of God in their lives. They felt that they were possibly being called into a particular field of service I, too, have sought others' advice about God's will in my life and have often been tempted to do so, but I have found that God is not pleased with this. He is the one who is ordaining and calling. He wants us to have our assurance in Him, and He is justly jealous of our running around seeking advice from men about something He is making known to us. The kind of faith He blesses is that simple faith to take Him at His word despite any outward evidence that things will work out as He has spoken. And thy father, which seeth thee in secret, shall reward thee openly. How marvelous it is to see those things spoken to us in secret become outward realities. Then is our faith multiplied and emboldened. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Chapter 2, God's Calling. God's Plan, a Man. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? 1 Samuel 10.1 The psalmist paused to wonder in the midst of his contemplation on the majesty of the universe that God in his sovereign will had chosen to set man over all the works of his hands. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Psalms 8.4 Of course, to man there is no answer to this question. We do not examine and question God's motives or his purposes. We only observe and hearken to his word. And as we do this, one fact stands out without contradiction. God does regard men, yea, it seems that man is all that God regards. In an age when devices and programs, organizations and denominations and affiliations, leaks and alliances are heralded as being God's ordained means of salvation of the world, this fact stands out in glaring contradiction. God's plan is, and always has been, a man. He created a man for the administrator and dominator of all his creation. When this man sinned and all God's creation was corrupted because of it, then God promised a seed or a second man by whom to bring redemption. When the race corrupted itself and God willed to destroy the life in the earth, he raised up by grace a man, Noah, to preserve the race of the earth. When God was ready to bring his children up from Egypt, he chose a man, Moses, to lead his people out. When Moses' purpose was expired, he raised up another man, Joshua, to possess the land for the people. When God's people sinned, God sent a man, a prophet, to preach to them and lay out terms of salvation. When God chose to discipline his people, he chose a man, Nebuchadnezzar in one case, as his servant to punish his wayward children. 
Is it not that our present day methods would appear totally ridiculous if placed in any of these situations? Can you imagine Moses organizing a committee and submitting his decisions to them for their approval and then going through diplomatic channels to negotiate with Pharaoh a ransom for the deliverance of the Hebrew people? God negotiates with no one, compromises with no one, is counseled by no one. He simply lays down the terms and then goes about his way to use his man to secure his will. All praise and glory to the providence of God. He has the entire universe, the weather, the animals, the insects, the waters, and the diseases at his disposal. He will accomplish his ends without man's devices. Had Noah organized a national disaster emergency corporation, they would have fumbled and bumbled and mumbled and discussed any possible thing that could have happened, but would have certainly never thought of a flood, for they had never seen rain, and if so, the Shipbuilders Association would have never gotten through the government red tape to prescribe the right kind of ark to build, and had they gotten it built, they would have wanted to save everyone, and then who would have convinced all those beasts and fowls to get aboard? The more you speculate upon such machinery, the more ridiculous it becomes, because the job God is doing is simply too great a task for any machinery or organization of mankind to attempt. In contemporary Christianity, we have seen some marvelous churches built through the obedience of a man. We have seen some mighty denominations rise under the thunder of men like Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and Spurgeon. We have seen some mighty world-shaking revivals under the preaching of men like Finney, Edwards, Whitfield, and many others. Then as these men begin to grow old, people wonder who will keep this organization, this work, this church going. Who is going to maintain this monument to this great man? Let me answer simply, no one. God does not intend for monuments to men to stand. He does not intend for organizations to claim an eternal monopoly to his power and work or any particular phase of it. It is God's purpose to use a man to fulfill his purpose in that man, within that man's lifetime, and that is the end of that man's work. Our works cease with our death. We do not store up capital investments in our labors on earth that continue to earn us dividends while we are in heaven. Those mighty revivals ceased with the death of Finney. Methodism's fires died out shortly after the passing of Wesley. The great denomination becomes mechanical, dead, and woody, holding on to traditions and bygone glories. The mighty soul-winning church fell victim to disputes and divisions and passed into disrepute. God has his glory in the man and his work through the man, not through machinery and organizations. Indeed, he must find it necessary to destroy the earth-anchored works of these men to prevent idolatry and bigotry. There is a very real obstacle to God's fulfilling his purposes through a man. That obstacle is the inherent depravity of man and his natural opposition to being led or overshadowed by any other man or even God for that matter. This was at nature Adam's sin. In taking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he showed his rebellion in two ways. The tree symbolized a holy portion in the garden, peculiarly belonging to God. Adam was made ruler of all, God only accepted, to whom he himself was to be subject. In order for Adam to be reminded of that regularly, he each day went out and helped himself to any tree he chose, but tithed the tree in the midst of the garden. Thus he was delivered from the sin of covetousness and by the act made a daily confession of his faith in God as king. Adam, being in a state of innocence, did not know good from evil. Having no ability to discern good from evil, he had no decisions to make but was totally dependent upon God. When we say he had no decisions to make, we accept the basic continual decision in which he was to abide, that is, the will to trust God rather than himself. This is the way God wanted him and the way God wants us. He will be God of all or not God at all. Now Adam, in taking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, like the prodigal son in substance, said, Father, I do not like the way you are running my life. I think I can do a much better job of it, and besides, I don't trust you. I doubt if everything you do is for my best interests. 
So if you do not mind, I will take my substance, the natural faculties of reason and the abilities of the flesh, and live my own life to please myself. It is this rebellion that is at the heart of every sin, and sinful men are loath to part with their personal liberty. The cry of today is, I want my rights. I want to do as I please. My way is right in my own eyes. Nevertheless, Jesus said, except a man humble himself as a little child, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. God is not impressed with how much you can do, how clever you are, or the talents you have to offer. They are all useless to him as long as they are tainted with the I will of your own purpose and strength. He is pleased only with the abandoned presentation of your body for his disposal. Yield. God's plan is a man. It is true in redemption. God does not have a plan of redemption. He has a man. God has provided a man, the captain of, captain of our salvation, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, the door, the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation is not a creed, not a plan, not a doctrine, not an experience, not an organization. Salvation is the man, Jesus Christ. When you have him, you have salvation. Only one man will be raised from the dead unto life everlasting, and that is the man to whom the promise was made, Galatians 3.19. And all who are in him, and only those who are in him, have part in the resurrection unto life. Building Faith Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. While it is not our purpose here to set forth a treatise on faith, we should briefly define its meaning in the word of God. Faith is that undeniable conviction that something is true, a conviction so overpowering that the substance virtually exists in our hearts, irrespective of supporting or contradicting external evidence. What is meant by faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God? God has a way of revealing something to us, either by his written word or his word preached by his prophet or perhaps revealed to us in prayer. It makes no difference, for God has sundry ways of giving us hearing of his word. We, in a sense, receive this word as fact or promise, but it does not immediately become reality to us. Our faith is weak, and therefore our ministry is weak, because without faith it is impossible to please God. What do we do here? Do we struggle and strive to increase our faith? Do we make ourselves believe stronger? How utterly impossible! As it is impossible for us by thought to add one inch to our stature, so much more is it impossible for us by power of mental process to add one iota to our faith. It is here that God intervenes with hearing or revelation. It is here that he makes cold, sterile doctrine, lifeless truths become reality for us. First, he makes known to us what he is going to do. He usually speaks by saying as he did to Joshua in the past tense, and this before the Hebrew host had even approached the city. See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Joshua 6.2 then he proceeds to do exactly what he has promised he would do, and we, the poor, weak, faith, yet desperate servant, shut up to faith with the wilderness behind us and the promised land before us, follow along and watch and demonstrate that I am the Lord, I change not. The walls crumble before the faith shout of the Israelite. God always prepares his called servant for the task they are to face by building up their faith in this way. This is what he proceeds to do for Saul. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion serve unto thee, for God is with thee. 1 Samuel 10, 7. With this admonition and the exact confirmation of all things that were spoken unto him by the man of God, Saul should have never had occasion to doubt God. With these mighty signs, God seals his anointing. With these signs, God gives testimony of his dealing with man, of his coming plan of redemption. He now gives Saul three signs. In these, we recognize the Holy Trinity and its work. The sign of the seeking father. When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorroweth after you, saying, What shall I do for my son? 1 Samuel 10.2 As Jesus said that in the mouth of two or more witnesses shall a thing be established, there are two witnesses to every man whom God calls to salvation.
the witness of the word and the witness of the spirit. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We cannot hear God's word except the spirit in us receive, 1 Corinthians 2.11, and spiritual whisperings that do not agree with the word of God are not of God. God gives two witnesses to testify and confirm to Saul that he has been divinely called. The father seeks for him. The father cares not for the asses. He is concerned about his son. And while the father is earnestly seeking and compassionately caring for his son, the son is running around looking for lost asses. Since we have already dealt with the nature of these lost asses, we only need to say now that the asses are taken care of, all things that we are anxious about, all things that we think we must attend to before we have time for God, are safely deposited for us in Him. Surely He is the Alpha and the Omega and everything else in between. Just forget about them, my son, and come home. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Revelation 3.18 The sign of the redeeming son. Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shalt thou meet three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. Once more, we feel compelled to apologize for dealing so lightly with a subject so extensive. In this case, the implications of the kid, sin offering, the unleavened and leavened loaves, and the wine are far-reaching, and the reader will be richly rewarded by exploring the avenues of light afforded by these types of Christ. The Three Kids The kid goat was the specified sacrifice for a ruler's sin offering, Le Leviticus 4, 22 and 23. Since Saul was to be made ruler of Israel, the presence of the kids and the signs given unto him are especially significant. As the lamb slain in Egypt for the Passover feast was symbolic of the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world in Christ, so is the kid offered, offered for the sin offering and the scapegoat which carried the transgressions into the wilderness away from the camp a type of the continual efficacy of the blood of Christ to cleanse us from our daily sins as we confess them. The former is one sacrifice perfected forever them that are in Christ. The latter is representative of the continual priesthood of Christ and daily cross in judging, cleansing, and delivering from sins. Remember that these signs are being given unto Saul for his experience with God, for his living out his calling, Therefore, the Lamb of Redemption is not present since God has already given Saul a new heart. 9.10 <clears throat> Also, this is why we have three kids here, one for each man. We have one Lamb that taketh away the sins of the whole world, but each of us must carry our daily sin offering cross, which is represented in the daily confession and repentance of sins. The Three Loaves in John's Gospel, we see the Word being made flesh and dwelling among us. We see the unleavened loaf of the Passover memorial, Leviticus 23. We witness the baking of the loaf in the baptism of fire spoken of by our Lord. We see the wave sheaf of the first fruits fulfilled in the offering up of the Son and the ascension of the Lord, the first fruits of the grave. Can you not now hear the majestic words of our Lord? I am the bread of life, John 6, 48. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever, John 6, 58. And the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. <clears throat> it is the word that sustains our daily lives and enables us with Paul to cry, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. The written word recorded in the Bible and made reality to us by the teaching Holy Spirit. The revealed word expounded to us by contemporary prophets, teachers, and evangelists. The word living reigning in our hearts, who is our Lord and to whom we are subject in everything. Like the personal sin offering, each of us must avail himself of his own particular needed portion, the word that proceedeth from God by which we live, hence three loaves for three men. 
We cannot live without him, for he is our life. The absence of this daily bread in a man's life does not indicate that he was once a Christian but has backslidden from the lack of bread. It testifies that he never knew the Lord. Once he tastes of this bread, nothing else will satisfy his hunger. He must have this daily bread. The Bottle of Wine in the kids, we witness the daily cross, the sin offering, the crucifixion of the flesh with the lust thereof, the perpetual confession and judging of sins of the flesh. In the loaves, we see the word rebuking, instructing, exhorting, correcting, guiding, leading, and encouraging. Now in the wine, we see the yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Oh, the wonder and marvel of it! Christ would live his life in us. He cannot do so as long as we are servants and slaves to the flesh. The word cannot fulfill itself in our lives because of the law of sin in the members. Romans 7.23 the seeking sinner cries out with Paul, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Jesus illustrated this truth in the parable of the new wine and the old and new garments. Matthew nine sixteen and 17. To attempt the preservation of new wine in an old bottle is to invite disaster. The Lord never taught, never even hinted at an easy salvation. He was constantly warning those who would follow him of the terrible price to be paid. Paul knew nothing of a cheap Christianity. The whole world was crucified unto him. He suffered the loss of all things. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. All things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 My friend, if you have not been subjected to a personal cross whereby you have by faith agonizingly suffered the crucifixion of the flesh and all that it cries for, then you can be sure the wine of the Christian life is not contained in that old rotten skin bag you are wearing. There is no conversion without repentance. But there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8.1 with the crucifixion of the body of sin, we have a new man. Then the water of the word now becomes gloriously transformed to the wine of the Christian life in the earthen vessel. John 2, verses 6 through 10. The new wine is contained in a new man, and both are preserved. There is a personal cross for each man, three kids, a personal word for each man, three loaves. But when we arrive at the Christian life, there is only one wine, one life, John 14, 6. There is the merging together of all into the one new man, Ephesians 2, 15. This is the unity of the church. We do not live to ourselves, but as a part of the entire body of Christ, one new lump with the old leaven of wickedness purged out, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And all the activity of each individual member of the body is in perfect harmony and in direct relationship to the activity of all the other members.